colleagues from the media, good afternoon. And thank you very much for joining today's virtual briefing. I do hope that all of you are healthy and doing well. This is the second press briefing on the government policies and the progress on their implementation in our concerted fight against COVID-19. Since early on, President Joko Widodo stressed that we are facing a war of two crucial fronts. They are heavily related, a war against the pandemic itself and a war against its socio-economic impact. Colleagues, health of the people is priority, but we have to win these two fronts. That is why Indonesia pushes to counter these challenges through a comprehensive approach. The theme for today's press briefing is Indonesia economic measures to mitigate COVID-19. And I'm very pleased to have with me Minister Erlangga Hartato, the Coordinating Minister for Economic Affairs. I'm also pleased to once again have Professor Wiku Adisasmito, Chair of the Expert Team of the National Task Force for the Acceleration of COVID-19 Mitigation. And Prof. Wiku will join us to respond questions from the media. So allow me to start by giving some recent updates on the government efforts to fight COVID-19. In line with President Joko Widodo directives on 20th of April 2020, we have stepped up our effort significantly in 1. Conducting massive tests 2. Carrying out progressive tracing and 3. Strict isolation measures. Let me now touch upon the progress on testing, capacity of hospital and others based on the data from the task force. On testing and the capacity of active laboratories to conduct tests, they have significantly increased. For testing, the capacity of testing has increased up to 12,000 per day. I repeat, the capacity of testing has increased up to 12,000 per day. And I would like to this opportunity to convey our appreciation to the government of ROK to assist us in the provision of the test kits. We are also conti continuously strengthening the capacity of referral hospital, both in the capital city as well as all around the region. In Jakarta, referral hospital will be used to treat severe and critical cases, while patients with medium and mild cases will be treated in emergency health facilities, such as Wisma Athlete, which has the capacity of 3,000 beds. In other provinces, our regional government have begun preparing emergency hospital, converted government buildings such as Hajj dormitories and training centers to help treat patients, while, of course, self-isolation under the supervision of the local public health office is also in place. To date, 668 hospitals have 10,321 beds for COVID patients. To ease the burden of hospitals and to allocate equipment and facilities for more severe patients, since mid-March, the government has stepped up telemedicine services. The services allow people to continue receiving advice and treatment from doctors and health experts without crowding hospital and health facilities. For example, one telemedicine provider in Indonesia has 
17.17.9 million monthly average users. About 6 million of them have used COVID-19 chatbot teleconsultation. On progress on the distribution of PPEs in Indonesia, between 20, 22nd of March until 21st of April, the government has distributed one, around 1.4 million PPEs. So I would like to repeat it again. Between 22nd of March until 21st of April, the government has distributed more than 1.4 million PPEs. We have also scaled up efforts on vaccine development, therapeutic medicine, and enhancing the capacity of our laboratories. Indonesia is one of 100 countries that are part of the WHO Global Solidarity Trial to find therapeutic uh, drugs for COVID-19. 14 one four hospitals in Indonesia have been designated to take part in the trial, nine of which have started clinical research trial this week. Aikman Institute of Indonesia is now developing convalescent plasma for COVID-19 treatment, while companies such as Biopharma is developing collaboration with foreign partners to produce future vaccine and be part of their clinical trials. Colleagues from the media, as part of our clear and bold commitment to further curb the spread of COVID-19, just two days ago, President Joko Widodo announced a ban on the annual ritual of Mudik or returning to one's home city or village during or after the month of Ramadan. This was not an easy decision, since this ritual is a deeply rooted uh, Indonesian tradition. But we have to take this bold decision to protect the health of the people and as part, as, as part of our effort to stop the uh, spread of the virus. Colleagues of the, uh, from the media, now I will move to my next point, Indonesia diplomacy and contributing toward the fight against COVID-19. Last week, I mentioned our effort to find innovative cooperation, innovative solution to fill the shortages of medical equipment and medicine. If we are not innovative enough, I'm afraid we will not be able to fill these shortages. So innovative cooperation shall be continuously explored and we will continue to work on this path. In addition, over the past week, Indonesia has been actively discussing the need to strengthen collective effort against COVID-19 with our partners. There are two messages that I always convey to fellow foreign ministers and to the international community. First, on the protection of women and empowerment of women to be part of the solution. We must ensure women has equal access to healthcare, financial support, and other essential services. On the other hand, when empowered, women can play important role to fight the virus. For example, 70% of global medical workers are women. My second message is about medicine and COVID-19 vaccine. So medicine and vaccine. All countries must have equal access to medicine and the vaccine when it is found at affordable prices. Without this commitment, 
developing and least developed countries will suffer the most. And I mentioned about the issue about the issue of affordable and accessible vaccine again this morning during the ASEAN US Foreign Ministers meeting on COVID-19 just this morning. I have conveyed these two messages uh, on women and vaccine, among others in different um, meetings. Weekly meeting of COVID-19 International Coordination Group, the teleconference of Alliance for Multilateralism, and teleconference with women foreign ministers on the impact of COVID-19 on women. I also raised the issue of medicine and vaccine in my statement two days ago at the WEF Regional Action Group for Asia-Pacific meeting. I underline the importance of relaxation of IPR obligation governed by relevant regime, whilst also promoting transfer of technology and know-how. Only then, will accessible and affordable vaccine be realized. In this WEF meeting, I also stress the need to strengthening and rejuvenating collaborative platform for public-private partnership and ensuring that our multilateral system delivers on the immediate needs of our people. Colleagues from the media, our diplomacy is also focused on strengthening regional and global mechanisms to deal with this pandemic, including in ASEAN and G20. At the ASEAN level, progress is evidence with the ASEAN COVID-19 response funds and the ASEAN Plus 3 Emergency Rice Reserve. We are finalizing now the procedure and arrangement for the ASEAN COVID-19 response funds. Japan has expressed its commitment to provide support for the ASEAN COVID-19 response funds. The ASEAN Secretariat also have been identifying other external funding resources that can be channeled to the ASEAN COVID-19 response fund. Meanwhile, to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on food security within the framework of APTER. APTER is the ASEAN Plus 3 Emergency Rice Reserve. Indonesia has committed to allocate up to 12,000 MT of rice reserve per year. Similar contributions are also made by members of ASEAN Plus 3. At the G20 level, the G20 countries finance minister and central bank governors have established an action plan to deal with COVID-19 pandemic and its economic and social impact. So colleagues, that is all from me. And now I would like to invite Pa Erlangga Hartarto, the Coordinating Minister for Economic Affairs, to convey some updates. Thank you, and Pa Menteri Erlangga, dipersilakan. Thank you. Ibu Foreign Minister, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, colleague, representatives, media representative, and expert dari BNPB, please allow me to thank Ibu Menlu for the comprehensive briefing. In my briefing, I would like to outline and elaborate following issues. One is recent national economic development. Second is national economic measures taken by the Indonesian government. And the third is priorities adjustment made due to the COVID-19. Indonesian government, as Ibu Foreign Minister say, that always 
put people safety first while balancing the social economics resilience in tackling COVID-19. Recent national economic developments, the government continuously monitor the economic and the impact to the society of the COVID-19 outbreak as follows. The rupiah exchange rate weakened in a year to date, but it has strengthened since the last few days. Uh, in April 20, 21st, it's about 15,468. And Indonesian export in March, year to year, uh, in compare with last year, in the same months of March, has been increased on the year-to-date basis on 2.9%. So recorded for export is 14.1 billion and import 13.5 billion. It means that until first quarter, Indonesian economic is still on the right track, though we see that there will be some uh, adjustment in the quarter second to the quarter third. The projected economic growth for next year, uh, or for this year, the government is proposing uh, government regulation in lieu of law with a scenario of economic growth at the range of 2 to 2.3. In line with some uh, economic outlook that is reported by IMF that only three countries, China, India, and Indonesia, will be growth above at the positive rate this year. On the investment side, based on the data of uh, first quarter 2020, the investment growth rose by 8% compared with the same quarter last year. The Jakarta Composite Index also under pressure. However, it has been re-strengthened recently. And retail sales in February experiencing the steeper decline as per other uh, countries in the, uh, in the whole 213 countries. As of 20 April, there is a possibility outbreak for uh, more than 2 million workers. National economic measures is, uh, has taken several economic policy. The first stimulus package launched in the February 20 to strengthen domestic economy through accelerating the process of dispersing capital expenditure the appointment of treasury officials and the implementation of tenders and disbursement of social assistance spending. And then also transfer for regional and village fund and expansion the number of benefit of recipient of the Kartu Sembako or basic staple goods card. The second stimulus package is to maintain public purchasing power, uh, corporate liquidity, in ease of export and import, the fiscal stimulus to industry sectors through exemption of reduction of income tax, and this has been extended yesterday to other 18 sectors. In the non-fiscal is simplification and reduction of export import restriction, and also uh, through establishing of the national logistic ecosystem. As uh, the advanced stimulus package in the government budget, the government has already uh, established the government regulation in lieu of law, and the government spending will be on the health safety net around 75 trillion, and the social safety net about 110 trillion, and the economic safety net is 70.1 trillion, and the national economic recovery measures or uh, financial sector safety net is 150 trillion. Under this uh, new stimulus package and uh, extension of the government uh, fiscal incentive, there are more sectors can be applied for this incentive, agriculture and forestry and fisheries, mining and excavation, processing industry, procurement of electricity, gas, water management system, construction, wholesale and retail trade, transportation and warehousing, 
and uh, provision accommodation and provision of food and beverage, information and communication, financial insurance activities, real estate, professional scientific and technical activities, rental and leasing act, education, health, health and social activities, art, entertainment, and also companies in bonded traded zone. So the total is the I6 is 1,830, 1,083 I6 number. And the government also uh, provide the budget for refocusing that uh, the, the government is already um, providing that the government regulation to ask the ministry to reallocate and refocusing their budget as well as the allocation for regional allocations that distribution used by the region should be prioritized for this uh, social safety net. And then on the Bank Indonesia side, they already reduced the Bank Indonesia seven days repo rate and now it's about 4.5% and also affirmation freedom to use the global and domestic custody bank as well the expansion of the zero wajib minimum from 5.5 to 5% and it's also dropped from 4% to 3.5% applies to the bank that conduct export and import financing. On the financial authority or OJK, they also uh, make the assessment of the quality of credits that is relaxation for the credit below 10 billion with the regulation of number 11 and also relaxation for this uh, small and medium enterprise. And the government also has issues uh, three legislation instead uh, not only the, per, the PERPU or government regulation in lieu of taxes but also the government uh, directions as well as presidential uh, regulations. And prior to the implementation of large-scale social limited, the government has uh, deployed the social safety net for the 20 millions of people on the family staple food program as, as well as family assistance program. And especially in Jabodetabek, the government provides for 4.2 million uh, staple food support. The government strategic food plan continues to be implemented on careful consideration and to balance the economic activities and health safety resilience supported by the industries. And the government uh, already formulated uh, in the government work plan. Uh, point one is the infrastructure and regional equity program, the development basic services and economic infrastructure to increase the resilience of most vulnerable and at-risk community. Economic infrastructure to be ensured to be undisrupted and the process of production and distribution will be focusing on the survival of micro and small medium enterprises and informal economy. Regional equity program directed to expand social security to improve access to quality basic services as well as to increase financial inclusion. The development of value-added economy, industrialization, and the expansion of employment opportunities relating to the economic nationality and globally with interconnectedness and vulnerability that the government is uh, continue to push and launching various initiatives and financial stimulus to ensure that the will of economic continuously moving and one of the in initiative is to maintain the growth of investment through infrastructure of development. Maintaining the growth of investment as well as opening the industry is uh, provided for safe jobs and lifeable of the people. And uh, therefore, the government has continued to develop infrastructure through a national strategic project. On the food price stabilization, uh, the government 
understand that uh, and also grateful that in the months of uh, June, April, May and June, the harvest for paddy rice is hopefully can be according to the plan and also the harvest for the sugarcane plantation will be on the month of June. Therefore, during Ramadan period, the government is uh, confident that the availability of the food and the price is, uh, can be stable or avoid the price fluctuations. And uh, inflation has been, has been kept at the low, around 3%. And the staple food uh, inflation also maintained at the same level. So the government of Indonesia will continue to work with all the relevant stakeholders, review policy prudently, improve good governance, and eliminate red tape and inefficient bureaucracy. We also respect rule of law to resolve complicated and overlapping regulated problems and through the omnibus law of employment creation and taxation during the undergoing legislative process, we believe that Indonesia is preparing not only to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic, but as well as to prepare for recovery of the economic sectors that hopefully through the fourth quarter or first quarter next year, we can be ready for the next challenge. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister uh, Erlangga Hartarto. Colleagues, now we move on to the question and answer session. And I know that prior to this briefing, we have many questions from various medias, among others, the Australian, Al Jazeera, Sky News, Central News Asia, Sinua, VOA, China Central Television, The Economist, Nikkei, Straight Times, People's Daily, AFP, Moroccan Press Agency, and ABC. And as we did last week, I would like also to divide this session into three. Pa Erlanga will answer questions related to the Indonesia economic measure. Professor Riku will provide some updates on technical data and details. While on my part, I will try to answer questions on the recent government policies, international cooperation and foreign national and some answer to several uh, questions have been addressed during my presentation, so therefore I will not repeat them again. So let me start with the question related to MUDIC that were raised from our friends uh, from The Economist, Al Jazeera, Sky News, uh, Channel News, Asia. As I said last week, colleagues, every country has its respective policies and measures. And it is fair to say there is no one-size-fits-all formula to address this COVID-19 challenge. In Indonesia case, the government of Indonesia have constructed policies that reflect the characteristic, the situation of Indonesia and its people culture and economy. Therefore, Indonesian government has been very careful in fo formulating the policies. I would like to reiterate again that the priority now is the health of the people and therefore the bold decision on MUDIC has to be taken. On concern as to why it took so long. I want to stress that the government wants to make sure that the society has had enough time to be prepared and fully comprehend the policy. As previously done with the large-scale social restriction, 
effort to communicate, engage, and educate the society regarding the policy will also involve many stakeholders, including religious and community leaders. It is definitely not easy to break a long tradition of the people to come back to their homes, but we need this in order to break the chain of the spread of the virus. It is very interesting. I read the article of Professor Wiku last week, and one of the statements in the article of Professor Wiku mentioned in one of the online news in Jakarta to change the behavior of 270 million people is a gigantic task, but it must be done. And we see the development in other countries where a lack of understanding of strict measures can also lead to unwanted circumstances. Therefore, a good understanding of the policy is essentially needed to help ensure compliance and avoid negative reaction from the society. In this regard, if you follow the development across Indonesia, communities are actually playing their roles to suppress the spread of COVID-19. And we have to capitalize this social capital, including what we call gotong royong or working together. So the value of working together works well in Indonesia society. And the call to ban mudik is also echoed by local governments and the communities themselves. And these are, of course, encouraging signs which prove that communicating, engaging, and educating the society goes a long way. And this is our unique approach that we will continue to strengthen by the day. Some colleagues, Moroccan Press Agency and AFP ask when travel restriction will be lifted and why Garuda Indonesia is still flying. To address this, I will again re-emphasize, as I did last week, that it will depend on the development of the situation. The policies, of course, we are all know, are temporary in nature and will be further evaluated in due course. What we want to see right now is that the curve is flattened. So on the question on why Garuda is still flying uh, to and from Australia, colleagues, I have a regular communication with Garuda. In fact, this morning, I had again my communication with Garuda Indonesia. The fact that Garuda Indonesia is still flying once a week to Sydney and Melbourne, in fact, helped to bring the people home, not only Indonesian citizens home, but other citizens home as well. And that is also very important to ensure the flows of goods. As I mentioned to you, that the restriction applies to the movement of the people, but not the flows of goods. And then the question by VOA on gender equality and socio-economic challenges faced by women. In all high levels meeting, be it in ASEAN, the UN, and recently, the WEF Regional Action Group for Asia Pacific, I always underline the need of empowering women as part of the solution to fight COVID-19 and to protect them during the crisis. I mentioned during my presentation that 70% of global medical workers are women. In Indonesia, 64% of MSMEs are owned or managed by women, and 60% of women-owned MSMEs 
produce, hand sanitizer, masks, and other health uh, protective gears to deal with COVID-19. So I'm very sure that by empowering women, this will create trickle-down effects to family and education, thus easing pressure caused by the economic disruption. And we will work hard to reflect those commitments by translating it into national development agendas in every country, of course, including in Indonesia. Now responding to China Central Television on the debate on the origin of the virus, I wish to reiterate that in this challenging time like this, let us focus on effort, including the global efforts to fight against the virus and its impact to social economy. And that is what our people needs now. Responding to ABC on current numbers of death of foreign nationals, out of 387 COVID-19 cases of foreign nationals in Indonesia, 13 deaths recorded, where 11 among them had underlying diseases. 49 individuals are being treated, 27 individuals are fully recovered, and 295 individuals are under isolation. So in addition to that, I would like also to share with you the number of uh, Indonesian citizens uh, abroad who has confirmed cases of COVID-19. The total number is 540 under treatment 385 recovered 131 and death 24 so that is the cases uh, with the indonesian citizen uh, abroad and then addressing to the afp question on our cooperation with china like with other countries Indonesia is having cooperation with China for COVID-19. China has assisted Indonesia for evacuation of Indonesian citizens from Wuhan last February. And at that time, Indonesia has also extended medical supplies to China as requested. Now, we receive assistance from China, among others, on the provision of test kits, PPEs, ventilators, and others. In short, we help each other to address the humanity challenges with and without cooperation that will be more difficult for all of us to win our fight against the virus. And lastly, on ABC question regarding Indonesia and Australia, we have not received any report of massive departure of Indonesia from Australia. Through our mission in Australia, we have advised all Indonesia to comply with the Australian policy and regulation, and we, through our mission in Australia, are closely in contact with our citizen and monitoring their well-being through various social media and online platform. So again, thank you very much for those questions. Now I give the floor again to Minister Erlangga Hartarto and then after that followed by Professor Wiku. Pak Erlangga. Thank you, Ibu Menlu. I would like to ask a few questions that address to me from Nikkei, Australian Financial Review, People's Daily China, AFP, that uh, on the issue of the scale of the expenditures that provided for this COVID-19, uh, Indonesia 
the financial support is around 2.5 percent of GDPs. I think what we are doing is actually we put a principle of uh, of integrity, principle of conservative, as well as uh, we are very careful to assess the situations. And the situation that we provided is for the year 2020 on our uh, revised budget 2020. So basically, in the Indonesian uh, that uh, the president has been signed the government regulation in lieu of law, actually we can make further step if required. So I think uh, we always evaluate the situations almost weekly or even on other case on daily basis. So when steps is required, the government can, uh, can put more extra effort and that's if uh, this one was allowed by the regulations that Indonesian budget deficit can be more than 3% uh, for the year of 20, 21, and 22, and will come back, going back to the 3% in the year 2023. So we, are, we have uh, rooms to maneuver. The second is Indonesian and Australian trade. I think in the first quarter, in compare with last year, is a little bit uh, increase about four and January February about 4.75 percent. As I say, that our Indonesian impact will be on the second quarter or third quarter. So trade with Australia in the last two months is still good. It's 1.2 billion, and Indonesian export is around 340 million, and import 871. So I think uh, we are hopeful that the, this uh, partnership with the agreement with Australia, I think it is important during this rough time because we import more staple food from Australia, dairies, wheat, as well as the meat that is needed by the people. And then uh, the stimulus has been, uh, will be in, uh, will be prepared for the people as well as for the corporate on the 1st of May. So we will see the impact, but however, we already assess the situations and I think uh, we are confident that with the stimulus, uh, especially we are focusing for micro, small, medium enterprises that the government already make a relaxation on the credit criteria and for the small and medium enterprises, the government subsidize the interest as well as the principal for the next six months. And the government will also assess what should be done next. And the budget that is provided for the economic safety net is about 70 trillion. That is mainly for uh, tax incentive as well as for the medium uh, scale enterprises. And then, uh, the question of the numbers of job that is uh, going to be lost, I think we assess through times. And at the moment, we have a pressure about two more than slightly over more two million people are having difficulties to maintain their jobs. And the government has launched the pre-employment card. The, the pre-employment card is an open access and the first government uh, public service that use uh, digital services that is open-ended, easy access, and also equal opportunities. So everyone can access the program. There are criteria, but since this is processed through the AI, we hope that uh, the equitable for Indonesian people will be rest assured by this program. And then uh, the last one, the issues about these food shortages 
Indonesian government assured the Indonesian people that will be enough staples during the Ramadan and beyond that and Indonesia maintaining both through the import as well as to improve the Indonesian harvest. As an issue of the one people that died due to hunger, I think I speak to the mayor of uh, Serang, Pak Safrudin, and that is not true. That's because of the heart attack and the government program for uh, the PKH or Family Hope Program or Family Incentive Program has been given to the 20 million of Indonesian family. So it's covered more than 90 million or if the family is five, around 100 million of people. And also on top of that, we have a program to support the subsidies for electricity payment under 400 VA as well as uh, that the government pay all the electricity bills as well as the between 450 to 900 VA, the government subsidy 50 percent. So we are sure with these subsidies and social safety net, the Indonesian people will have enough food for the Ramadan. Thank you very much. Ibu, oh, Pak Wiku. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ibu Retno Marsudi, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, for this opportunity to address the international media. Thank you, Bapak Erlangga Hartarto, our Coordinating Minister for Economic Affairs. I'm here on behalf of Bapak Doni Monardo as our lead of National Gugus Tugas or Task Force in COVID-19 to express several things regarding COVID-19 updates. As we have already known, the world has been forced to confront this crisis. It affects not only the people's health, but also on how we can adapt to dramatic and extreme changes. The society is expected to shift ways of working, communicating, commuting, these are economic pillars and, in essence, our way of living. All of this done in order to battle the virus. Health is the foundation of a country economic development. And an investment to the people's health is an investment to the economy. I will now answer several questions from the media. First questions from the Australian. Why didn't Indonesia begin producing its own reagents several months ago, given this problem of sourcing reagents has been a constant issue? To accelerate the diagnostic process, Indonesian government is still using the imported reagents to fulfill the country needs. Meanwhile, the Indonesian government through the Ministry of Research, through BPPT and also the universities, has developed the plan for PCR reagent development. Currently, it is in the process of the first trial productions. The second question is from the Morocco Press Agency. Why is the COVID-19 mortality rate in Indonesia so high? International Convention in reporting the cases, confirmed, recovered, and death cases is based on the golden standard. Therefore, conventionally, every country in the world needs to follow that, and Indonesia is obliged to follow these steps. But this does not reflect the real critical situation. We understand the reason why World Health Organization have certain standards. But as Gugus Tugas or Task Force, we need to answer and assure 
the public uproar that keep on asking on data transparency by providing more data that is the global standards that is data about ODP and PDP. High mortality rate for COVID-19 in Indonesia at this moment due to limitation for early detection and late diagnostic. Effort to increase laboratory capacity continue to be improved from RT-PCR reagents and also human resources. Improvement in the quality of data also need to be done, hence mortality rate data becomes more reliable. The next question is from Voice of America. Will Indonesia health system be capable of dealing with the surge of patients, especially in rural areas like Papua? Unlike Java, there has a lower population density in Papua. So the spread of COVID-19 always under monitors the National Task Force for the acceleration of COVID-19 mitigation on behalf of the central government. However, primary health services reach all districts there, so if there is a surge of patients, we can provide a rapid response. The National Task Force for the Acceleration of COVID-19 Mitigation continues to coordinate with all regions in Indonesia, including Papua. Papua already can inspect RT-PCR at the Papua Province Regional Research and Development Agency. Epidemiological investigations have also been carried out to trace contacts from patients who have been confirmed positive COVID-19 by the Provincial Health Office in Papua. However, there is a request for assistance to fulfill the needs the Gugus Tugas COVID-19 on behalf of the central government is ready to accelerate the phase. The next question from the US Fox News, mentioning that this virus may have originated in the Wuhan National Biosafety Laboratory and the virus had escaped from the facility and caused the outbreak in the central Chinese city. But China had denied any link to first coronavirus outbreak from laboratory. How do you think about this theory? First of all, many parties can apparently make their own theories based on their observation and beliefs. Several theories circulate around the world, but the limitation of evidence makes them end up as speculation. The utmost important part in this, what we can build up our belief based on only speculations. One of the uncovered facts is that COVID-19 virus has three genotypes, A, B, and C. The form of the three genotypes distribution is not well discovered yet. To add, Indonesia will conduct genomic research involving more data sets from Indonesia in order to develop better understanding in regards to this pandemic origins and distributions. The next question is from the Al Jazeera, Sky News, and The Economist. Why did it take so long for the government to come to the decisions to ban Mudik? How will the government enforce this ban? Why do penalties only start from May 7? Sanctions are needed, but a humanistic and effective approach need to be rolled out first. Keep in mind, before the prohibition, the government was already campaigning to not go on mudik. However, a survey of the Ministry of Transportation shows that 24% of the people still intend to go home, even though there is an appeal not to do it. We are making sure that the provinces and cities are really ready to implement PSBB, especially on the budget readiness. 
the local task force team over there and also local command post. These regulations are implemented stages and continuously. The main essence to reduce people mobility. The next question is from Channel News Asia. How will you ensure the people won't pray together at the mosque during Ramadan, such as the Taraweh prayers? Will there be sanctions for people who violate the regulations? The Ministry of Religious Affairs has issued a circular containing suggestions of congregational prayer at home, such as Friday prayers, Taraweh prayers, as well as holding of Eid prayers. Muslims in Indonesia have been quite cooperative with the circular. The Indonesia Ulama Council, or MUI, and also Nadatul Ulama Movement, or PBNU, and also Muhammadiyah, and other Islamic groups issued fatwas to ban Taraweh prayers. The Muslim community is also seen as cooperative, as seen from the absence of Friday prayers for four weeks in many areas since the issue of the Minister of Religion circular. Sanctions so far have not been implemented. The government implementing persuasive approach to the prayer organizer to no longer hold large gathering of prayers. The authorities are in close coordination with the communities. As mentioned by the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Coordinating Minister for Economic Affairs, we encourage the international collaborations to support each other needs. We are in process of producing international standard medical grade protective equipment, personal protective equipment, or PPE, using local materials. This will be able to help Indonesia and the world to protect our precious medical personnel in caring the infected patients. COVID-19 intervention ultimately must lead to permanent behavior change. The community needs to start taking preventive actions instead of curative. Disciplines and maintaining your distance, remember to always wash your hands and wear masks. If we can collectively change our behavior, reaching 70% of the population from smaller groups up to the largest scale nationally, then this will allow us to win the battle. In closing, I would like to say we are in dire need to strengthen our country strategy. There is improving public health resilience. This strategy will ensure the future of people's well-being. I would like to say that the uncertainties that arise within these two weeks to one month might look unsettling. We cannot predict what will happen next. The virus sets the, their timeline, but we can shorten that timeline with hard and smart works, especially with strong coordination across all sectors, making it an all Indonesia, all level campaign. However, we have to visualize the end in mind. We must make milestone along the course toward the pandemic timeline. So stay healthy, everyone, and stay united. We are all in this together. Let's get out as champions together. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Pai Langa, and thank you very much, uh, Prof. Viku. And thank you very much, colleagues from the international media, for participating in this uh, briefing. And to close, 
colleagues, tomorrow we will start the holy month of Ramadan. So let me wish those who are observing a blessed and peaceful Ramadan. Ramadan Mubarak. Colleagues, once again, thank you very much. Stay healthy, stay strong, stay united. Thank you and see you next week.